Greetings, this is Greg. The advent of jet fighters near the end of World War II brought about the demise of the piston-powered fighter plane. However, it didn't happen suddenly. Due to uncertainties about jet performance, especially takeoff performance, range, and engine longevity, many manufacturers kept some eggs in the piston engine basket until about 1946. Thus, there was a period in very late World War II when a number of new planes, I'll call superprops, started to emerge. As an example, here is a P-51H model Mustang. At first glance, it looks like a common World War II P-51D. However, it's a totally different airplane. It has a longer and deeper fuselage, different tail, smaller landing gear, a lot of weight-saving techniques in the construction, and an entirely new wing. You might notice the wing's leading edge is straight all the way from wingtip to fuselage, which is different than on an earlier 51. It also featured the upgraded Packard Merlin engine, the V1650-9, equipped with water injection, enabling it to reach over 2200 horsepower via 90 inches of manifold pressure. There was also a new prop to handle that power, and the top speed of the P-51H was over 470 miles per hour. There is some calculated data from North American to support a 490 mile per hour top speed at very low weights. I couldn't find any actual flight test data to back that up. The P-51H did make it into production before the end of the war, but was too late to see combat in World War II. It continued on in military service, but was overshadowed by the newer jet fighters. Over at Republic Aircraft, they were also very busy coming up with a super prop of their own. In fact, it wasn't long after the first flight of the P-47 Thunderbolt in May of 1941 that they unveiled the design of a plane that would become known as the XP-69. The plane was to be powered by a liquid-cooled 42-cylinder turbo-supercharged radial engine. That's right, a liquid-cooled radial. We don't know too much about this airplane because Republic's records were destroyed in the 1980s. We do know that it was intended to have counter-rotating props, four 50 caliber machine guns, and twin 37 millimeter cannons. It was to use a new NACA wing profile, pretty much the same thing that would be seen later on the P-51H we just talked about. It was to have a bubble top canopy, which isn't shown here because this is just a mock-up. The XP-69 was canceled, and I don't have any original source stating why, but I think we can surmise very safely that it was due to engine problems with the Wright R2160 liquid-cooled radial. The airplane was designed around this engine, and I think the engine had serious problems. I base this on the fact that no production airplane ever flew with that engine, and there were other aircraft in development that were designed for it, but as with the XP-69, those developments never went anywhere either. After the XP-69, Republic pushed forward with three other super props, the P-47H, the P-47J, and the XP-72, all of which are based on the tried and true P-47. I'll start with the P-47H, which was a P-47D-15 packed with an inverted, liquid-cooled V-16 made by Chrysler. Performance data for this plane is scarce, and original test data seems to be non-existent. Secondary sources put its maximum speed at about 490 miles per hour, but I think that's a calculated number. The plane did fly. There is a video on YouTube with color, fit color footage of it in the air but it seems it didn't get far enough into its development to generate any meaningful test data. The plane probably had engine problems as that engine never made it into production. This may have been a loss for Republic aircraft, but in a strange way, I think it really worked out for Chrysler Corporation. This was their first Hemi engine, or at least their first liquid-cooled Hemi engine. There was an air-cooled tank engine built as a joint venture with Continental, I'm not sure which was first, but they both had hemispherical combustion chambers. In any case, it seems they really latched on to this combustion chamber design as it became common in Chrysler Corporation engines starting in 1951. 
This design was not unique to Chrysler, but it was very unusual in U.S. automobiles and gave them an advantage over Ford and GM. Then in 1964, some marketing genius at Chrysler trademarked the word Hemi, and to this day, that word is synonymous with power. Now, the modern Chrysler Hemi engines are not really Hemis, meaning they don't have true hemispherical combustion chambers, but hey, there's a marketing plan at work here, and they do own that trademark, so they can call anything they want a Hemi. And the combustion chambers in the new V8 Dodge Challenger and its stablemates are somewhat hemispherical. So the legendary Hemi engine got its start in a P47 Thunderbolt. Strangely, they named the top model of the Challenger the Challenger Hellcat. I think Challenger Thunderbolt would have made more sense. The next contender was the XP47J, which was essentially a fully optimized P47 Thunderbolt. It still had the Thunderbolt's R2800 engine, although now with 2800 horsepower. This was in 1943, and at a time when a normal Thunderbolt had around 2,000 or maybe 2,300 horsepower, depending on exactly when in the time period you're looking at. The XP47J also had aerodynamic changes and was lighter than a typical P47. It was the first piston engine fighter to exceed 500 miles per hour in level flight. Its actual top speed was probably about 505 miles per hour at altitude. The plane certainly had a lot of performance, but the project was dropped. The XP-47J didn't really fail. In fact, by, I think by any reasonable performance standard, it was a success. But I also think it's obvious why they didn't move forward with it. The J model represented the end of the line of R2800 powered P-47 development. No further improvements in performance were realistic. It wasn't all wasted effort, though, as that 2800 horsepower engine made it into combat in the P-47 Mike and November variants, and a lot of the aerodynamic work transferred over to the next project we're going to talk about. So that brings us to the XP-72. As with these other planes from Republic, there just isn't a lot out there. Uh, the destruction of Republic's records were a real loss, but at least with planes that entered service, like the P-47, we have test data and reports from others, but for prototype and experimental stuff, we have almost nothing. Still, people have been requesting info on the XP-72, so I'll do my best here. And by the way, these, these airplanes I'm covering, this isn't exactly in chronological order. Um, a lot of this development was concurrent uh, with the other airplanes. Anyway, regarding the XP-72, let's start with the engine. It's the Pratt & Whitney R4360 Wasp Major. This is a four-row, 28-cylinder engine with about 4,362 cubic inches of displacement. That's just shy of 71.5 liters, so this is a huge engine. Any four-row radial is going to present cooling challenges. Sometimes even two-row radials have these problems. To minimize this, each row of seven cylinders was offset a little bit from the row in front of it. This combined with baffles helped cooling and gave the engine its corn cob nickname because the configuration kind of looks like a corn cob. You might notice that the inlet space for the cooling air at the front is quite small, especially for such a large engine. As with the German FW190, the XP72 has an engine-driven cooling fan to help out. This allowed them to keep the engine very closely cowled for aerodynamics, yet still have enough cooling for the engine. The big R4360 had a history of cooling problems in various aircraft, and while they only built two XP72s, I've never read about them having a cooling issue, so I suspect that this fan arrangement worked pretty well. In my FW190 series, I talk about the cooling system for the BMW radial and that fan specifically. Some people have implied that the cooling fan in the FW190 was a waste of time due to the drive power requirements. They don't have any kind of mathematical evidence or anything that's from the period to really back this up, but they say it must be the case because nobody else copied it. Well, first of all, I don't think that's evidence of anything at all. There are lots of reasons not to use a cooling fan. However, the XP-72 does have one, and it's obvious that Republic knew what Focal Wolf had been up to and concluded that, at least in this case, uh, dry, sacrificing a little bit of engine power to drive a cooling fan and trading that for an aerodynamic advantage was worth it. 
Moving on, the exhaust outlets and cowl flaps are also a lot like the FW190A8. The outlets are on the side of the cowling, not all the way around or mostly all the way around um, as they typically were on US radial fighters up to that point. The exhaust stacks angled out the sides to provide forward thrust. This was possible because the XP72 does not have a turbo supercharger like the P47. But instead, the XP72 is designed with a dual stage mechanically driven supercharging system. Up front, the engine was attached to the engine was a centrifugal supercharger, much like that in any other radial engine combat plane of World War II. Then there was a second supercharger aft of the cockpit driven by a long drive shaft. This gives us the two stages, the first stage, which is the rear supercharger, and the second stage at the engine. So far you might be thinking, well, so what? The F4F Wildcat had a second supercharger driven on a separate shaft. So did the Corsair and the Hellcat. Now in those cases, the shaft was a lot shorter, but a remote second supercharger certainly wasn't extra special at this point in aircraft development. What was special, at least for any US radial engine aircraft, was that this rear mounted supercharger was driven by a variable speed fluid coupling much like what we see used on the Messerschmitt 109s. The Bell P-63 King Cobra also had a similar drive system for its uh, primary stage supercharger, very similar to what's on the XP-72. So it appears that Daimler-Benz was onto something with that variable speed drive, but the US adopted it too late to fully develop it. Actually, the same can be said of the P-63 itself. Now this variable speed supercharger drive enabled the XP-72's engine to retain full manifold pressure throughout a huge altitude range without throttling losses just like the P-47's rear mounted turbocharger. It's not clear why Republic decided to go with a mechanical supercharger for the, uh, the aft mounted supercharger rather than an exhaust driven turbo. But I think it's because there was no exhaust driven turbo supercharger in existence at that time that was large enough to do the job. In any case, the mechanical supercharger had the advantage of being able to retain exhaust thrust for propulsion and still avoided the throttling losses. I'm sure it cost more to drive than a turbo, but as we've seen in other episodes, probably not that much more. I have a video that covers these concepts, the concept of exhaust driven turbos mechanical driven superchargers along with the draw the losses from throttling and drive power requirements. I'll put the link for that in the description if you're interested. Of course there was a large intercooler between the stages as there was in the P47. Altogether the engine initially was set up with 3450 horsepower. Even without the second supercharger, meaning without the aft mounted supercharger, it still had 3000 horsepower. Post-war development in other aircraft had this engine up to 4,300, so there was a lot of development potential, which again I think is likely the reason the XP-72 was chosen over the XP-47J. Of, of the two prototypes, the second one had counter-rotating props. The production version was to use the counter-rotating propellers with 3,650 horsepower, giving it a calculated top speed safely over 500 miles per hour. In testing, the plane did 490 miles per hour with the non-counter rotating four-bladed prop. It's not clear if it had its second supercharger installed. It also had an incredible climb rate of over 5,200 feet per minute. Firepower wasn't lacking either. It could take six 50 caliber machine guns, which I'm sure would have been changed to eight. I say that because they went to six for the P-47 Mike and then back to eight for the November. The six gun setup was not popular with the pilots. It had two other armament configurations. It could go with four 50s and dual 37 millimeter cannons, which I think would have been probably the best setup, or an all cannon armament of four 37 millimeters. Uh, that 37 millimeter cannon will single shot destroy, I think, any airplane in the sky, um, maybe short of like a B-29 or something. The U.S. Army Air Force was so impressed with the XP-72 that they placed an order for a hundred of them 
uh, right after they saw the test flights. However, the order was canceled as soon as it became apparent that the war was going to be won with P-51s and P-47s and, of course, the jets were coming. So there was just no reason to build the XP-72. Propeller-driven airplanes were starting to run into a brick wall in terms of speed. There were three problems. First, piston engines were getting near the end of their development potential. The rate of improvement was going to slow down. Even today, with the exception of electronic controls, nearly every feature on a modern automotive engine existed before or during World War II. These include double overhead cams, four valve per cylinders, turbos, superchargers, intercoolers, roller bearings, and or followers, nitrous oxide, multi-stage supercharging, 150 octane fuel, and more. Even variable valve timing had already been developed, although it had almost no use in aircraft because aircraft operate in a very narrow RPM range due to the constant speed props. So variable valve timing in aircraft never went anywhere during this era we're talking about, but uh, it had been invented. There, are, there were patents on it dating back to the early 1900s. The potential improvements in piston engine aircraft propulsion were going to be small in the post-1945 world compared to what they had been. I'm not saying there wouldn't be any improvements. Sure, things get better. Things have become more advanced. But nothing like the advancements they'd seen in piston engines from, say, 1900 to 1945. Now, on the other hand, it was very clear that the new jets had a lot of room for development. So the next problem we're going to have to talk about that limits speed is drag. And of course, this affects both jet and propeller airplanes. Now, this isn't a P-47 chart. It's a generic chart from aerodynamics for naval aviators. But the point is to show how total drag increases quite a bit with speed. At high speeds, the total drag is made up mostly of parasite drag. That parasite drag increases as the, sp as the square of the speed increases. In other words, at 200 miles per hour, you will have four times the parasite drag you had at 100 miles per hour. So at very high speeds, every increase in speed causes a disproportionately high increase in drag. And we need to offset that drag with thrust, which brings us to our third and probably biggest problem for the propeller-driven airplane, which is that for a given amount of power, the propeller's thrust will decrease with speed above a certain point. So in other words, even though you've still got 2,000 horsepower, as you're going faster and faster above a certain point, the thrust from the propeller decreases. So not only is drag increasing, the amount of power we need to make up the thrust we're losing to offset that drag is going up even more. This is hard to understand, and I'll go over it briefly, but I want to say that Adam, the engineer, has an excellent video on this subject, so I'll put a link in the description in case my basic description doesn't do it for you. You can go watch his stuff. Take a, Well, you should go watch his stuff anyway. He's a good channel. Anyhow, take a look at this formula. It shows that the power required is equal to the thrust required times the velocity divided by 325. Now, thrust required is equal to drag. Those For this purposes of this discussion, those are the same thing. The 325 number is used with speed in knots. If you were using miles per hour, it would be 374. Now, let's do some simple math. Suppose we have two identical airplanes, identical except that one has a 2,000 horsepower engine coupled to a 100% efficient propeller, and the other has a jet engine with 2,000 pounds of thrust. Somehow, all other factors with the airplane are equal. This is a, a fantasy scenario. Keep in mind that drag and thrust required are the same number. So in this case, 2,000 pounds of thrust offsets that 2,000 pounds of drag. And with that much thrust, our fictional jet airplane can do 325 knots. The PR in the formula is for power required. We need that for our propeller airplane, not for the jet. We do the math and we see that at 325 knots, our 2,000 horsepower will exactly offset the 2,000 pounds of drag. It'll do it just perfectly. So far, the 2,000 horsepower propeller airplane is equal 
to the 2,000 pound thrust jet, meaning at that specific speed, 2,000 pounds of thrust uh, is effectively the same thing as 2,000 horsepower. Now, it's going to get a little more, more complicated. Let's try and speed the airplane up to 450 knots and see what would be required. So we're a design team and we have to make this, we can't change anything on the airplane, but we've got to make it go except power and we've got to make it go 450 knots. Well, if we calculate the drag, it's going to go up to uh, 3,834 pounds of drag, roughly speaking. I, I didn't do this exactly. I'm just assuming it's all parasite drag, which it mostly is. So now our jet needs 3,834 pounds of thrust. That's a lot more than 2,000 pounds, but how does it compare to the prop plane? The prop plane now needs 5,309 horsepower. Consider what would be needed to get a 2,000 horsepower R2800 up to 5,309 horsepower. I don't think it would be possible while maintaining any sort of reliability. Even the much larger WASP Major never got that high in a normal racing application. Although it's possible some race planes like maybe Dreadnought have numbers that high. Either way, going from 2,000 horsepower up to 5,309 without increasing the drag was going to be a problem. On the other hand, the jet only needs to go from 2,000 pounds of thrust up to 3,834. That's still quite a bit, but it's not unrealistic. For example, the Rolls-Royce turbojets in the British Meteor started with 2,000 pounds of thrust apiece and eventually uh, worked their way up to 3,600 pounds of thrust each. Consider that in February of 1946, just about six months after World War II ended, the Republic F-84 flew with an engine giving it over 5,500 pounds of thrust. Soon that same engine would be bumped up to 7,500 pounds with water injection. So when you consider the thrust requirements for speed in terms of power and thrust levels available from the different engine types, it's very clear that higher speeds heavily favor the jet aircraft. And that's not even mentioning the propeller tip speed limitations. I'm going to get into propellers in another video. So it's not a mystery why Republic then pushed forward with their new jet fighter, which became the F-84. It first flew in early 1946, and soon they were doing over 600 miles an hour in this airplane. Even then, the F-84 was made obsolete within a year of its first flight by the new swept-wing jets. Progress was moving forward at an incredible rate, so much so that the XP-72 and many other late-war airplanes were obsolete before their first flight. Even post-war jets were often obsolete after just a year in service. That's all I have for today. I want to thank all my Patreon supporters. As this video goes online, I'm sending out links to the Patreon page, which has some updates. I don't have a manual for the XP-72, I think that's pretty obvious, but I did put a Bell P-63 manual in the Patreon section. It has an excellent text description of the variable supercharger drive. Unfortunately, no pictures, um, but the text is helpful. So, some may find that interesting. I also added a P-51H manual and more manuals related to the last aircraft video I put up. Uh, Corsair manuals, 109 manuals, and more. Have a great day. Goodbye. Oh, and uh, just one more thing. When you travel internationally, you usually start the journey expecting certain things to be different from one country to another. Maybe people will be speaking another language. Driving on the other side of the road, you might see street vendors selling chocolate-covered crickets. Not only will food be a bit different sometimes, but when you do find the same food, it will usually have a different name. We all know about the Royale with cheese. What I find more interesting are the unexpected differences. Let's talk about elevators. We've all been in elevators, and they all work the same way, don't they? You walk up to it, press a button telling it you want to go up or down. Eventually, a door opens. You go in, press a button for your desired floor, and off you go. Elevators work that same way in the U.S., Germany, Australia, Asia, the Middle East, and Africa, pretty much everywhere. Yet in Sicily, at least in some places, they have another way.
It confuses people initially, but I think it's actually superior to the way everybody else is doing it. We're in our hotel in Sicily, heading to the elevator complex, and there are four elevator doors here. They're labeled A, B, C, and D, and there are no up or down arrows to indicate where we want to go, just a keypad. We put in our destination, which is floor zero. It tells us to go to door D. There's no guessing which door is going to open up because the keypad tells you. So in door D, uh, we go into the elevator, and once you're in here, you are along for the ride. There is no, there are no buttons to uh, change your destination. So the system works pretty well. I think it's kind of interesting. And another bit of trivia there is that in Europe, the ground floor is almost always floor zero, not floor one. They have a different way of counting, I suppose. Anyhow, that's it. Goodbye.